The Unshackled Waves, episode 58. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for this week's review show. And of course, I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of the Unshackled, Sukith Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everyone. Uh, This week, it was the 50th anniversary of the 1967 uh, constitutional referendum, uh, which uh, made sure that Indigenous Australians were of equal value as non-Indigenous Australians. Uh, To achieve equality, uh, this should have been enough, but as is always the case with uh, the left and social justice movements, they always want more. Equality is never enough, and they want special privileges for what they describe as oppressed groups. And this week, uh, during the anniversary, a group of uh, so-called Indigenous leaders gathered to say that uh, what's being proposed at the moment, which is Uh, constitutional recognition, meaning that the Constitution will say that Indigenous Australians were here first. That is apparently not enough. And so now they had the Uluru Statement from the heart, and now they want a treaty and their own uh, Indigenous Parliament. We also saw this week the continuation of the saga involving Islamic schools. This is where uh, Islamic councils and societies uh, uh, rip off taxpayers through inflated rents and other forms of charges to Islamic schools, which basically siphon money from from the the taxpayers to the Islamic societies to spend on God only knows what. Uh, Sukuth was at a rally in Penrith on Sunday uh, to prevent the construction of an Islamic school there, and so we'll be going into detail about uh, what happened there. There was also the next leg of uh, Donald Trump's overseas trip. This time he was in Europe, and he made an important statement when meeting NATO leaders. He wanted wanted them to pay their fair share when it comes to uh, NATO defence expenditure, which is good because uh, Trump wants to make sure that American taxpayers are getting a fair deal. And if America is paying for all the overseas militaries of European nations, that's not very fair. And of course, we also saw, uh, surprise, surprise, yet another controversy in the same-sex marriage uh, saga with uh, Margaret Court declaring in a letter to the editor that she was boycotting Qantas because of its CEO, Alan Joyce's uh, support for same-sex marriage. Uh, Now, conservatives have been claiming that uh, Margaret Court is uh, uh, being bullied because of her position, because there was a lot of criticism from it. However, I think uh, both of us believe with this uh, controversy, it's a bit overblown. I mean, Margaret Court, yes, she has free speech, but she's not free from criticism. And there is a bit of a worry here that conservatives are becoming a bit triggered and snowflakes when it comes to uh, having their viewpoints criticised. But we'll start with the Indigenous referendum anniversary. And as I said in my introduction, it's the, the 50th anniversary. So the focus of the news this week was Indigenous issues. And of course, uh, Q&A, ABCs, they had their all Indigenous uh, panel on, on Monday night. So basically, there was no white people allowed. Um, so, so as I said, that the, uh, 1967 should have been enough to achieve equality. But as is always the case, it, it, nothing's ever good enough where uh, Australians are still racist, we're still oppressors, uh, unless we fulfil the latest demands of the the social justice movement. Yeah, I think, um, again, it's a great example of how they're trying to have equality of outcomes rather than, you know, being happy with uh, a fair equality of opportunity. Um, The 67 referendum was enough to actually give them equality. It was enough to give everyone equality. And, you know, they're saying that people are racist, that whites are racist, when actually over 90% of people voted for, um, in voted yes in that referendum. So I think, again, it's just another example of how, as we move on, the left is trying to get more and more privileges, especially for oppressed minorities, as they say. And, you know, they're trying to move away from equality of outcomes to an equality of opportunities. 
I mean, look at all the special privileges Indigenous Australians current get, currently get. I mean, there's all these affirmative action programs. You're always asked mm. on various application forms. Are you an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? And if you tick yes, you it get special consideration, which is yeah. not not equality. It's it's not equality. It's privilege. Um, because because even in universities, they have um, you know Aboriginal only programs um, simply because they were they are Aboriginal, um, not because they are disadvantaged. I mean, it's of course it's understandable for universities to have programs for people who are disadvantaged. But you don't need to break it up into Aboriginal and white or whatever. It's who's disadvantaged and who's not disadvantaged, and that's a different story. Um, you know, this is exactly what Pauline Hanson, for example, raised. Um, 20 years ago um, and that's what got her you know m m messed up that's what got her got the media against her that's what got everyone else against her um, because she said that aboriginal people are, f are having all these special privileges like um free well interest um free home loans or low interest home loans they're getting other um you know affirmative action programs that for their benefit and the problem is ultimately it's the lawyers and the solicitors and the consultants who are making all the money you know she's mentioned 40 million dollars was spent um on just the lawyers and the and, and the and the consultants and the solicitors not none of that went to the actual land rights claims so you know it's, it's firstly it's a waste of time second it's a distraction from actual problems and third no one is benefiting from it yeah pauline hansen she she said she wasn't against welfare period she was just against uh, welfare on the basis of race yeah exactly she said you know she she said that she doesn't believe that anyone's disadvantaged based on their skin color i mean look at all the white people who are disadvantaged um do they get any special white only programs no they don't um so you, again we understand that there are disadvantaged people and non -dis uh, and advantaged people but the, the thing is they're dividing people based on race and hypocritically next minute they're saying they don't believe in racism i mean what you're doing is racism itself because you are dividing people based on race and so six since 1967 we've had the land rights uh, decisions i mean that was supposed to you know bring us closer together to equality and then of course we had the apology to the stolen generation uh, that still wasn't <laughs> enough and of course now we yeah. have uh, this new attempt to alter the constitution to, or well, it's being proposed that to recognise that Indigenous Australians were, were here first, but there's also uh, some people, even Tony Abbott, who believes that we should enshrine Aboriginal culture in the constitution, which is actually quite dangerous because judges will interpret that to mean God only knows why. But of course, this week yeah. with this Uluru statement from the heart, the uh, so-called Indigenous leader saying, no, this is not enough. We actually want our own House of Parliament, which you have to be Indigenous to vote in and to be a member of, which, which then opens the question, like, how do you define someone's uh, Aboriginality? And of course, now they want a, a treaty as well. I mean, so it's, it's just getting every time, every time we move up to the, the next thing they want, they say, no, that's not good enough. We need something else. And that is, you know, that, that's a good point. And that is exactly why people right now are saying we should not have had the 67 referendum. I'm not going to say who it is, but I know that people are saying that we shouldn't have had it, had it because you know, it resulted in a slippery slope. Um, I'm not saying I agree, I agree or disagree with them. All I'm going to say is that, you know, the fact is that we give them something and they want more of it. Um, and as you said, you know, they're trying to have a separate parliament. And that's just, who knew? I mean, who knew that? sort of thing could happen this year, because that is just the most outlandish um, desire that anyone can have. I mean, it's going to result in dividing the entire country into two. And people might think, but they're only Aboriginals, you know, that means it, they only occupy a small percentage of our population. Well, the problem is, it's going to lead to other ethnicities. Now, you, you, if you're going to give Aboriginals a parliament, then it's going to expand and expand, and it's going to divide the country even more based on skin colour. Um, and, you know, the left is going to keep fighting for micro and uh, the oppressed minorities, etc. Um, and it's just going to keep expanding and the slippery, the slippery slope is going to get worse and we're going to have an even greater problem and a more divided country and that's going to result in greater instability.
And plus, why should Indigenous people get a veto power over uh, de uh, decisions that are that are made by our government? I mean, shouldn't all Australian citizens vote count for one vote, one value? I mean, why should what, what we want be over overrid by a, a small minority? And just because their ancestors were here first, why does that give them a greater say? I mean, we're all Australians today. Most of us were born here. Like, yeah. Aren't we all equal now? Yeah, I mean, I just remember what Pauline Hanson said, you know, he, you know, there's, what's the point in saying that we were here first, or this is our land, you know, you know, where the hell am I supposed to go? That's what Pauline Hanson said. And that's true, you know, people were born here. And, you know, if this isn't anyone's land anymore, it belongs to the Australian people, okay? it doesn't belong to Aboriginal people. Um, and that's just how it is. That's not a bad thing. That's just how it is. That's, that, that's the reality. And if you're born here, then you, you are completely and definitely an Australian. Um, so, you know, they're asking for all all these privileges from people who didn't even commit those alleged atrocities back 200 years ago. I mean, there are different interpretations that say that, that they didn't even happen. Um, but assuming they did happen, there weren't these people who are alive today. People who are alive today weren't alive back then. It's not their fault. And what happened to individualism? What happened to actual equality? Um, people are saying that your your ancestors' actions somehow have an impact on your actions, that you should be responsible for what your ancestors did. That doesn't make sense, especially from the left. I wouldn't expect that. Um, so again, they're asking for privileges from people who didn't even do anything to them, and they're asking to do other country. And they're, what they're, they're essentially saying that they want to actually don't want to be part of this country. And that just says something. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that the indigenous industry carries on. They make out like yeah. there there is no equality when there there has been equality since 1967. Yeah. So it, it, it's basically what they're saying now is we we want privileges. That's what what's all it's about now. And we as the right need to say that no, we will we will not accommodate this at all. We will not placate them because as we've seen, they always just want want more. It's never good enough because they they're never going to say okay. We, we can see that you're not racist anymore, so we can move on. They're never going to say that. They won't. They will always keep asking for more, for more. And if people cave in, if our politicians, if Malcolm Turnbull, who I, I expect him to cave in, and if he caves in, then it's going to make things even worse. And the slippery slope will get even worse. And we will see all these, uh, all these leftist tactics expand and keep expanding. Um, and, you know, if, if they want to be part of this country, then they need to actually work with other people instead of looking at their skin color and saying because that's what i expect from them you know it, you know that's what i expect from you know some sort of progressivism if that's what i, I look for and it's they they should work together with other people but no matter what their skin color is so if they want to have their own um you know territory or their own land then that is a huge problem and i hope the politicians don't cave into that yeah Hopefully, and they've given an indication so far, or at least the coalition, that they're not going to accommodate this, and even Labor's been quite lukewarm on the idea. But let's move on to the issue of Islamic schools, which has been in the news for quite a number of months now. But, Sukha, you, you participated in an uh, uh, anti-Islamic school rally in Penrith, hosted by the yeah. Party for Freedom. Do you want to give us a report yeah. on what happened there? Yeah, so it happened um, on Sunday, and it happened started at around um, one o'clock, and so we went there, and I, I went there, and it was a it was uh, it was an, a rally against the construction of a planned new Islamic school in Penrith. Now Penrith is considered to be in Sydney, um, it's considered to be like the only Western Sydney sort of main suburb that is still a beacon of the Anglo-Australian, the, the, the traditional Australian culture, um, because all other areas in Western Sydney, uh, apart from Penrith and maybe Richmond, are all taken up by the migrants and they're all, you know, there's too much um, non-assimilation, there's too much, you know, extreme multiculturalism going on and too much segregation going on. Um, we saw Mark Latham doing that in other parts of Western Sydney. Now, Penrith is, to, is considered to be like the place where that do hasn't happened yet. And the Party for Freedom's goal is to make sure that it keeps that way. Um, so the problem is they're planning a new school in Penrith and God knows what they're going to do there. I mean, there are imams who are going to be there, who are going to be teachers and they don't even speak English. Um, 
what are you going to teach them? Are they going to teach them that they should uh, simulate, or are they going to teach them that they're Islamic and they're different, and that they should continue being different and you know sort of separate themselves, estrange themselves from Islam, which is going to result in an even greater risk of radicalization. And that is the problem with these new Islamic um, programs to infiltrate and set up their own institutions and somehow take over different areas of our cities. Well, it's not even the fact of what they're teaching, which is a problem. It's the financial management of them, where the, yeah. the, the federal government, which of course always wants to be politically correct mm. to implicate Islam, ha has said that you know, you're you're running these schools with taxpayers' money and all the taxpayer money seems to be siphoning off to your Islamic yeah. councils and societies. You're ripping off the yeah. taxpayer. And, of course, uh, these Islamic societies and councils, they go and spend the money on God only knows what, you know, extremism, terrorism, who knows? We don't. And that's the problem with mosques. That's, we, that's why we need to investigate mosques because we don't know what's happening in the mosques. We don't know where all the funding is going. Same with halal certification. We don't know where it's going. I mean, we are paying for that. We are, It's our money. That's We are paying for that. And we don't know where it's going. And same thing applies here, especially with schools. I mean, this taxpayer money is being spent. Um, and, you know, we all, we're we already seeing examples of how we'll have more segregation. For example, um, Right, I think, yeah, right here in, I think it was in Sydney or Adelaide, I'm pretty sure, or Brisbane. Um, in a major city, I know there's a, a, an Islamic town, walled, it's, a, it's practically a walled town and a school together. Um, and that's where all the Islamic people are going to live um, and shop and, you know, carry on their livelihoods. And that's going to be a pretty big problem. If we see that spreading around the country and see such segregation around the country, then we don't know what's going to happen because especially considering the fact that there is no transparency regarding Islamic schools or mosques or any other Islamic institution, it's going to be a problem because our taxpayer money might indirectly be funding terrorist groups or extremist groups. Yeah, you mentioned halal there. I mean, that's another yeah. money siphoning operation. Yeah. I mean, it's not using taxpayers' money, but it's pretty much the, the same sort of idea that you, yeah. you, you set up basically this... Uh, operation which on the face of it is like a good uh, is is reasonable Islamic uh, uh, practice as yeah all the money is going to these secretive societies so so they can uh, go go and use the money for their for their own ends and of course it's the same with uh, the amount of uh, Islamic people who are on uh, welfare I mean it's the exact same thing I mean uh, rather than working for the money they're finding ways to basically skim it yeah, and regarding halal, um, again, it's a very good example that we can use as a benchmark to measure this issue because there was a lady, um, her name was Liz, and she spoke in the rally, she gave a speech, a very good enthusiastic speech, um, and she said that she was, um, she, well, she, she was the manager, or she set up a website that said, you know, stop the mosque at Lithgow, um, because they were planning to build a mosque at Lithgow, and that was going to be a very huge problem for them. It's a small town. Um, and so she said that she actually asked, she interviewed um, that person who was going to actually build the mosque. Um, and I think was, his name was Osmond, um, Osmond, Osmond Muhammad, I'm pretty sure it was. And he said that, you know, she, well, she asked him, you know, she asked him, why do you want halal? And he said that, you know, we have halal because it's a medieval historic way of making sure that food is purified and food is prevented from getting infected. And she was like, Fair enough. But then we live in Australia in 2017 um, and we have technology that can prevent any food infection. We can prevent um, any problems with food going bad or, you know, anything that ruins their pure nature. Um, and she said, told him and, she, and he was like, well, it's a religious requirement. But you, know, you just said that it's a health requirement. Um, we had the technology to do something about it. But now you're telling me it's a religious requirement. That's why it's a very... Um, you can't, it's a very suspicious issue. You can't trust them um, because they're saying one thing about science. We have technology to respond to them and then they go back to the religious requirement thing. But then that doesn't make sense. Same thing here. You know, taxpayer money being spent. They're saying that, you know, we just want to teach our children the Islamic things. OK, well, we don't we obviously don't want that because we, we can't trust that. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen. And it's going to result in radicalization, just like um, Curtis Cheng's death. Curtis Chen's death in Sydney uh, last last year, and our taxpayer money might be indirectly funding it. Uh, 
It also leads on to the question, which is a separate matter, should Islamic schools exist in Australia? Now, yeah. I, I believe that if we're allowed to have Christian schools, then uh, by implication, there should be allowed to be Islamic schools. But I definitely think that uh, suburbs should be able to say, we don't want an Islamic school in our area, or we don't want a mosque in our area. But I don't think we can ban the, the setting up of Islamic schools if the community consents. Yeah, um, I, mean, I I do kind of agree with you. I mean, I personally would want to not have them, but reality, I mean, I need to face reality, and the reality is that's not realistic. You know, I can't just say we can need to ban Islamic schools. Um, it's more realistic for me to say, firstly, okay, if you want to have Islamic schools right now, given that we're going to keep Islamic migration, you know, assuming that's going to happen, have Islamic schools, um, but make sure it's transparent, make sure we can investigate, make sure we know what's happening, and make sure taxpayer money isn't going into it. Um, because, you know, we shouldn't be funding any minority schools, minor, minority religious schools. We should, our taxpayer money should, we go, should go to Christian schools, I think, because that is our heritage. You know, that is Australian culture. That's the heritage. Islam is, Islam is not Australian heritage, so therefore there is no obligation for taxpayers to fund those schools. So therefore, if you have Islamic schools, fine, okay. I'd, I'd rather not, but have them, but make sure it's we can investigate and make sure it's transparent and make sure our taxpayer money isn't going into it. Yeah, I, I definitely think if, if Muslims are already living here and they're citizens, then they're, they're entitled to the same rights as other, other Australians. Uh, so, so they have the right to set up their, their own school. But yes, I mean, this you know, ba basically rorting of their taxpayer funding, I mean, uh, this, uh, this needs to stop. And this is why the federal government is uh, thinking about stripping their funding. Yeah, because, you know, again, as I said, we, we, we need to make sure that our funding isn't, isn't going into some radicalization program. Yeah. I mean, I think it's reasonable to prevent, you know, any more Muslims coming in. But if we've already yeah. got Muslims here, yeah. we can't really take away their rights. Um, well, yeah, I guess, you know, you, you could look at it that way. And that's a reasonable argument, I guess. I mean, thing is, I suppose the other argument, the, the other, the other non-leftist argument, the other more right-wing argument would, would be, you know, uh, if, if those schools can be harmful. So if you're banning Muslims because of the risk involved with Muslims, I mean, our argument is, Muslims, oh, taking in Muslims, increases the risk of terrorism and crime. Um, so if our argument is that, you know, banning Muslim migration is to do with risks, then why can't we ban Islamic schools? Because they are also risky. And why can't we ban mosques? Because they are also risky. So I guess in that, in one sense, the equality and the, the equal rights sort of thing is important. I guess on the other hand, um, you know, if there is a risk involved, then, you know, I guess we need to, do, we should try and investigate at least. Yeah, there's certainly nothing wrong with monitoring them to make sure yeah. that they're not spreading uh, extremism. But of course, yeah, there shouldn't be an outright ban on them. Okay, so let's move on to the final leg of Donald Trump's uh, first overseas trip. He went to uh, Europe, and one of the major events was he uh, made a speech at NATO when he asked NATO nations to pay their fair share because the US pretty much pays for uh, a lot of it, which is not fair on the American taxpayer, especially when most of its operations are in Europe. I mean, the European nation should pay. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, taxpayer money shouldn't be spent on something that probably isn't even doing anything these days. I actually cannot think of any constructive or productive action that is done by NATO, except as he once told me earlier, I think it was last week he told me, the only thing they do is make things worse with Russia. I mean, they, the only thing they're good at is blaming Russia and you know, opposing Russia. There's nothing, they're not good at anything constructive, just like the UN. Not good at anything constructive or productive, and I just find it to be a very globalist organization. Yeah, I mean, it's good that uh, Trump is, you know, making sure that American taxpayers get a fair deal. But yeah, NATO itself should should not exist. I mean, it should have been <laughs> disbanded after the fall of the Soviet Union, because that's why yeah. it started to make sure to counter the communist threat from the Soviets and Eastern Europe. But now that Russia's capitalist, why does it still even need to be there? I mean, uh, 
the fact that the US has troops in in Eastern Europe and places like Poland and the Baltic states. I mean, mm. that, uh, that that's the reason why Russia is so aggressive in asserting its interests because there, there's all these foreign troops right on their doorstep. Exactly. I mean, we had they had the Warsaw Pact, and the NATO and Warsaw Pact were like the big sort of um, two organisations that were representing the two sides. It's no longer there. Um, so why do you have this? I mean, it just, sh it just goes to show that, um, you know, it didn't end, it didn't end with the Soviet Union's collapse. It ended, it, well, it didn't end at all. You know, they, they wanted to actually keep going on with um, the sort of the neoconservatism with the foreign intervention and the NATO was meant to sort of ma make them do that, help them do that. And right now they're trying to counter Russia for no reason. Um, and tax money is going into that. And I'm, I'm glad Trump did this because we, since recently we have been seeing him, you know, doing some things that I find or that we find quite disappointing. He said that, you know, well, there were the Syria strikes, which were a bit uh, c controversial, but, you know, we, we did understand them. Um, and then there, there was um, his comments saying that I'm both nationalist and globalist. You know, I can work with both. That didn't go well with his election um, rhetoric. And then what right now he's doing, he, he said, he said how it is, and he told NATO, our money can't be spent, you must pay more. The deal the deal is you you must all spend two percent of your GDP on defense. Most of you aren't. Only five out of 20, 20, 28 NATO countries are paying their actual two percent of GDP on defense. Um, and that burden cannot fall on our people because we have things to fund too. Yeah. And the reason why NATO continued after the, the Cold War is is because basically the military industrial complex, I mean, the the US government, they didn't want to cut, uh, cut, cut defense because that would cause uh, too much upset to people who are, are employed in the defense industry. So that's why it was continued and, and why it continued to, to annoy the, or annoy the Russians, which is why we are, we were at this degradation of relations between the the US and Russia. Um, it's good that the Trump is trying to get a fairer deal for the American taxpayers and looking to uh, ma make sure that US funds are spent prudently uh, in this region. But we also have to remember that Trump has vowed to increase defense spending in the United States, which doesn't really fit what he said here at NATO. So he's saying that I want a fair deal for American taxpayers, but I'm still going to increase the defense budget. I mean, that, that, that's not prudent at all. Um, I guess the thing is, um, I personally have, I personally support defense funding increases um, because I think it's, you know, it's essential to have that, especially right now. But what I'm, I think that what he's saying is that we shouldn't be spending money on an organization. We should be spending money on our own defense, on our own people, not spending money to somehow, um, you know, prop up other countries, prop up the UK, prop up France, you know, who who don't really, um, who aren't really helping us, who aren't even helping me, the Trump, the president, in any way. Um, so, you know, I think that's his argument. You know, we need to spend our money on our defense, not on your defense. Um, and I think that's his argument right now. But there's still all these US bases all over the world yeah. that um, yeah. Trump hasn't said he's going to get rid of. Yeah, that's yeah. No, that's that's that, that's a good point. I mean, if he does spend money on defense, he should spend it on his own, you know, within his territory. It's not, you know, send it to other countries because he told Japan, he told South Korea, you know, um, we can't spend money on your on your assets. We have our own assets. Um, so that's a. I I think that's. I guess it's a bit complex because I I do believe that you should spend money on defense. Just on your own territory, not, you know, going off to other bases in other countries um, or on giving it to international organizations like NATO. But, but you don't need to spend more money on defense to prove that. You can basically get rid of the, the propping up of foreign nations, militaries, and redirect the funds to your own budget rather than spending more overall. Because always the concern is if you keep building up the uh, the, the military, then you've got to give them something to do. And of course, there's endless wars that the neocons want to get involved in. And so you open the door up for the next president to say, right, we need to use these forces. Let's send them to wherever. Yeah, definitely. No, that's true. Um, you know, if he, uh, yeah, I think right now, I think it's he, what he should be doing is, you know, get out of those countries and, you know, disassemble those bases and revert, divert that funding to his own um, defense in his own country, in his own territory. Um, but, you know, what I'm saying is I, I, I understand 
why you know he is spending more money on defense because I don't think he wants to, which I disagree with. I don't think he's that ready to actually dis- disassemble, which I disagree with. I want him to dis- disassemble those uh, those bases or those um, other assets in foreign countries. But and I understand that you know he's keeping them and spending more money on his own defense, which um, you know. I don't really hate as much as him spending money on an entire organization. Yeah, there are, obviously we prefer that he disband NATO completely, yeah. but that's yeah. very difficult to do. And yeah. so we're, we're hoping that Trump, because uh, he's reaffirmed his commitment to NATO, whether it's just a, a 5D chess move on the on the yeah. part of Trump, that he's, he's, he's basically saying, you know, oh, I think NATO is important, but at the same time saying to Russia, you know, I'm not really going to do anything to threaten your sovereignty in Europe. Yeah, and you know, I think relations with Russia are you know very turbulent right now. And I think you know the problem is, I think I think this tactic to, by telling NATO fund yourself, um, I think it's quite it's quite good in the long term with Russia because you know you know that right now the U.S. Russia relations are very sour. They have deteriorated deteriorated to a level that we didn't expect them to. Um, so I think this, uh, thanks to the media, I should say, and this, um, I hope that that that. This tactic can make sure that the, that relationship is mended. Hopefully, there's a five-day chess thing going on right now between Russia and Trump, um, but who knows? Well, it doesn't help when John McCain says that Putin's a bigger threat to yeah. world security than ISIS. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm not scared that I'm going to be blown up by Russians. <laughs> like, what a ludicrous claim! Yeah, I mean, look at look at all those terrorist terrorist attacks done by Russians. I mean, yeah, I just. Do not know what's going on inside his head. I mean, it's almost like he's saying that ISIS attacks. Well, he's almost like, like he's saying that Russians are terrorists, you know, because he's saying that Russia is a bigger threat than ISIS. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Um, I choose to ignore that purposely because I just we, we just don't have time to spend, you know, t- considering uh, these people who are just just so stupid beyond measure. It's it's when neocons say stuff like that I'm, that I'm glad yeah. Donald Trump is the president. Exactly. Yeah, and I want him to do something more about it. Okay, so let's move into our final topic now, which is, of course, the Margaret Court controversy, because she sent a letter to the editor to a newspaper in Western Australia saying that she was going to be boycotting Qantas because of its uh, CEO's... Uh, uh, Alan Joyce's uh, advocacy for same-sex marriage, and this was followed by a tense interview that Margaret Court did with the people on the the project, uh, where where she um, put, uh, put uh, ju- tried to justify her um, position. And now this has led to uh, conservatives claiming that this is an, another example of same-sex marriage advocates. Uh, bullying people who disagree with them, which, and now I've upset a lot of uh, my conservative friends by saying this, but I think this whole thing is overblown. I mean, people are just disagreeing with Margaret Court. They're not bullying her. Yeah, I think um, it's quite scary and it's quite concerning because I think people are um, sort of getting quite triggered. I I feel like people are getting complacent, like conservatives, like right-wing people are getting have gotten so complacent with recent victories in Brexit and Trump that I think like hearing any opposition has resulted in them getting a bit triggered um, over it because let's 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 be honest, Margaret Court wasn't bullied. She, nothing happened. All people did were they disagree with her. I mean, yes, I understand that the project interview, um, there was a lady who they called Miss Piggy, um, and you know she 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 made she made it out into a joke, and she just you know she she made the, everyone laugh. Again, it was just a joke. You know, you weren't being bullied, and I think um, you know you just need to make sure that you you you, you can have your views, which I agree with. I agree with her views. But you know, it's just you should expect disagreement. You can't just say that you are being bullied because that was not being bullied at all. Yeah, I, I mean, people are going to disagree with your views. That's a fact of life. I mean, of yeah, you know, we're supposed to be against people getting triggered and acting like snowflakes. Like we make fun yeah. of the left who uh, you know get triggered by people disagreeing with them. Yeah, people on the right are doing the same thing. Like, oh, you know, there's people that disagree with Margaret Court. How awful! Like, well, that's the fact of life. Exactly. You know, you're right. I mean, there's a difference between. I understand there are very. You know, we have the fascists, for example, who are saying that you know you can't the, telling the left you can't have your views, and you know you, you're a disgrace. That's a different story. I mean, this is like 
this is playing the victim card. Margaret Court was playing. I'm sorry, but the Margaret Court was playing the victim card um, because she was saying that you know here here, I, here I'm saying my views. These are my views. She was given the opportunity to say them. I mean, she's saying that she wasn't given the opportunity. She's saying that they cut her off. They didn't. She was given the opportunity um, most of the time to say what she wanted to, and they just disagree with her. I mean, it's not it's not their fault that your argument was bad. And I agree, your argument was bad. Um, uh, again, I'm sorry if you're you know if, if you're like very social conservative like me and you agree with Margaret Court. I agree with Margaret Court. I agree with her argument. But I'm, what I'm saying is her argument was bad. Her argument used the Bible, um, which she should, but she shouldn't stick to that. She should use more logical arguments like the slippery slope, like the impact on children, like everything else, you know, all the, all the other scientific logical arguments that you can use instead of just sticking to the Bible. Yeah, it was a very poor, poor case that she made. And I think that that's yeah. why the yeah. people on the project you know, did ridicule her and, you know, hold the, the front page, you know, people on the project yeah. don't agree with the conservative point of view. I mean, you know, with, yeah. I, I, I know that, I, and, you know, I have first-hand experience with how the, the pro project treat people they, yeah. they, they disagree with. You, exactly. But, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. that's just how the project are. I mean, why did we expect them, you know, suddenly to treat Margaret Court any differently? Exactly. I mean, especially the. I mean, she was. I thought she was treated quite well in the sense that her argument was quite bad, and you know, I thought people were being quite good. I mean, I was annoyed. I mean, obviously, we get annoyed when lefties start making arguments and they, you know, they say things. That's that's natural. We get annoyed with that. That's okay, um, because that's stupid. We know that. But the thing is. Um, you shouldn't just say that you're being bullied and that you know they're not giving you the opportunity because you are being given the opportunity. Um, and, you know the Miss Piggy, for example, I'll call her that because I don't know her, I don't know her name. Michelle Miss Piggy. She said, you know, what I, was that her, was yeah. that her name? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, Michelle. Um, she said, "What are you gonna? What are you gonna? You know, tell all the gay people who are gonna get offended and who are gonna commit suicide because of your views." Again, typical leftist, you know, inner city Greens voting response. What are you gonna do um, when your views are somehow gonna result in? people committing suicide. Margaret Court didn't say anything logical to that. She didn't say, well, we should promote strong mindedness. We should promote um, people's, well, we should promote the value that we sh should be able to handle other people's views. She didn't say that. She didn't promote any, lo she didn't use any logic in that. She, all she said was the Bible, the Bible. That's okay. Again, as I said, I, I believe Christianity is I, the, the foundation of our society. I, I'm not Christian. I believe that, that it is. But you shouldn't just stick to that in because we, we all know it's the current year. It's 2017. People aren't going to be persuaded by your religious arguments. You need to use logic. And logic is on your side. The logic is on our side. The rationality is on our side. You just need to choose that and argue with it because you can't just stick to religious arguments anymore. Yeah, there, there was too many conservatives who had what is called confirmation bias. I mean, they because Margaret mm. Court was was on their side, they automatically short, thought that you know her arguments were good, which they weren't. I mean, it was a very poor case for uh, yeah. traditional marriage that, that that she made. I mean, yes, that's how it is in the Bible, but in today's society, you need a bit more th than the yeah. Bible, and so that's the reason yeah. why she was yeah. so criticised as well because she didn't make a, a strong case. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she again. She, I I know that her church, for example, does a lot. Um, her local church does a lot in trying to further our cause and trying to further the the conservative slash paleo libertarian, I guess, cause. Um, but you know, that I expected more from someone who came from that sort of institution, um, because. As I said earlier, we, we, we need to talk, talk about the slippery slope. She, she had hundreds of things she could say, well not hundreds, but she had many things she could say um, in the project and she had many arguments to counter Michelle or whoever, um, but she didn't choose to do that. Um, you know, it's it's the exact it's it's, it's weird because we see left celebrities saying superficial arguments. I mean, their arguments are superficial. Their arguments don't make sense and we hate them. But then again, now we have a right wing, I guess, sports athletic celebrity who also being from a modern perspective not from not from a personal perspective but from modern perspective who is being quite super, um, superficial in her own um, argument because we need more than the Bible argument and that's the truth that's the reality and Margaret Court's views on marriage and also homosexuality in general because she doesn't approve on it and thinks that um, gay people can be cured through prayer I mean this wasn't uh, a new 
thing. I mean, she's had these views for basically yeah. the last 20 years. I mean, I remember the last time yeah. she, she aired them, and I think it was about 2011, 2012. I mean, so it's basically, basically this is a beat up by the media because she wrote that letter to the editor. They've basically, because the media always want drama. And so, oh, Margaret Court said this, oh, the, yeah. uh, you know, same sex marriage people said this, yeah. oh, you know, and, and the conservatives have, you know, uh, they've, they're now embracing the, the victim complex that we're supposed to be against by saying that, yeah. you know, oh, you know, well, look at Margaret Court, a victim. And there were, there was, Three different articles. There was one by Andrew Bolt, Rita Panahi, and Miranda Devine saying Margaret Court was being bullied. So they all bought this uh, victim line, which was really disappointing. But the fact is, like, even though, like, there, there's always a few extremists who are going to say that Margaret Court Arena should be renamed, but it's not going to be renamed because it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, nothing's going to change the fact that, you know, she is the, the greatest uh, female uh, Grand Slam yeah. player of all time. I mean, that's why the arena is named after her. It's not, it's not named after her because of her views on, on homosexuality. And uh, she hasn't lost any positions. I mean, she's basically carry, carrying on like before. I mean, you know, she, she'll, yeah. you know she'll, she'll get over it. She has, I mean, nothing, all, all that's happened, like nothing's happened. All that's happened is that, her feelings have been hurt. Um, th that's okay. I mean, that happens when you hear other people's view. That that's natural. But look at Cooper's beers. Look at what happened to them. Look at all other pe other organizations or other companies who had a simple, you know, a superficial association with anything to do with um, debating about. I mean, not anything to do with actual same-sex marriage, but anything to do with debating about and questioning same-sex marriage. I mean. Any a small association and their whole company sort of almost went down. Um, those people, those people had it tough. Okay, that that's bullying. That that's a problem. That's the thing we're talking about. But this is different. I mean, having your views, having your views um, scrutinized and criticized, and I guess um, sarcastically made fun of. Eastern Seventeen is the media sar sarcastically made fun of in public. Doesn't make it um, something to sort of you know drag on about. You know, doesn't make it shouldn't result in three articles by you know smart conservative commentators um, who are saying that she's being bullied. Um, that's not how it works. Cooper Spears, that was a different story. That was something that that was really bad. This is this is different. This is just criticisms, and this is what you should expect. Yeah, the Cooper's controversy was quite different because basically the company was yeah. forced into a, a groveling apology for their views and there was a, a boycott uh, yeah. ca a campaign against them. I, with Margaret Court, it's just people you know di uh, disagreeing with her. I mean, she hasn't lost any jobs or, or anything like that. She is going to carry on ju just as before. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, again, um, I just want to. I just want to say that you know. Again, it's just uh, you need to be prepared for other people's views. The right wing, I, guess, I think, should, needs to sort of conserve their strong-mindedness. Needs to conserve their use of rationality, not just their use of religion. I wish we could use religion. We can't anymore. Um, I mean, we can't just use that. We need to use rationality and logic. And the right wing needs to conserve. We are conservatives. We need to conserve our ability to remain strong-minded and you know handle other people's opinions. Yeah, so our message to conservatives is please don't play the left left games. Uh, do not yeah. be you know triggered yeah. by disagreement and don't try to play the victim because that is reducing yourself to the the left's level. And we need to you know yeah uh, accept the fact that people are are going to disagree with us and and just move on from it. Not say oh you know I'm being victimized. Yeah, that's that, exactly yeah, that's right. Uh, so we've run out of time now. So thank you once again, Sukath, for being my co-host this week. It was my pleasure. And of course, the usual reminders apply at the end of every show. If you haven't signed up for the email list, please sign up at the unshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, we also have a few important upcoming events. I'm very excited to announce that we'll have a... Uh, a correspondent at the International Conference on Men's Issues on the Gold Coast next month, uh, which is very exciting. You can also see our other events at the unshackled.net slash events. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And we've always had problems with uploading the, the videos to uh, Facebook because they only allow the videos to be 45 minutes long, which some of our episodes go f go for over 45 minutes. So from now on, we're just going to say selected episodes will be on Facebook. 
And of course, don't forget to keep checking the Unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening and we'll see you next time.